uh, unit three, lesson four. You're looking for the tasks to complete for U3L4. Uh, you can find it under assignments or again on the Canvas Science 2 homepage, the weekly calendar. Today's date is the 20th. As usual, we'll start off with a little breakout room discussion. I'm gonna throw the question in the chat right now. Here we go. If you were famous, what would you be famous for? Would you wanna be a famous actor or a famous chef or a writer or cure disease, something? Uh, think about it for 20 seconds. We'll come back together in two minutes. Rooms are open. All right, thank you very much for sharing everybody. Um, next on the docket is um, homework check. You just had to uh, complete and submit the graph of your local climber graph. Uh, hopefully you all did that in class. I'm seeing 14 responses to the reflection, so that's looking good. Uh, you also had the climber graph part two, a uh, little worksheet, again, looking at graphs answering questions. Uh, same here, I'm seeing 14 attempts, so that's looking good. Uh, for the Hewitt reflection, I'm only seeing 12, so. Um, if you haven't submitted this yet, please make sure to do so. But otherwise, of the people who have submitted it, it's looking great, all uh, selected correct answers. Uh, if you did get any of the multiple choice wrong, remember you can take this multiple times and improve your score. You have up to 10 attempts to do that. Uh, any questions or anything you got stuck on or wanted to comment on related to the homework? All right. As usual, I'll do a really quick review of the general reading you just did, and then we'll dive into an activity today relating to the Coriolis effect, which you read about. First thing is gonna just be a short video about the Dust Bowl. It's just over a minute and a half long. I'm gonna optimize my screen here. It's from PBS. Check it out. This fall on PBS, they had come to the far edge of the Great Plains in search of a new beginning in the last place in America where a family could claim a homestead and build a future. We had the best crop that we had had in 1929 and everything was looking up. A sea of grass, once the domain of Indians and buffalo, disappeared beneath the blade of a plow. I saw the whole country transformed in the sunset glow. All the brown prairie turned to gold. But then it was as if the land rejected them. The rains stopped and the winds came. We saw this cloud coming in, black, black dirt. And I'll never forget my grandmother. She said, you kids run and get together. The end of the world's coming. It came like a black wall, a tide of destruction that crashed over the broken plains, choking the life out of everything in its path. You never really escaped the dust. It always found its way in, and that's, I think, what drove people crazy. Some would pull up stakes and move on, but most stayed, always looking to the promise that next year would be better. We were just too selfish, and we were trying to make money, and it didn't work out. Ken Burns tells the story of a generation that was buried and what it took to dig out. All right. Had a brief part of that in the chapter reading. How many of you, a quick show of hands, have heard of the Dust Bowl? It's usually covered in history classes. Nice. It is a classic historical um, account of agricultural mismanagement, right? Um, that in the Central American Plains, they went crazy, right? They cleared all the land of any native plants uh, planted corn and all these other um, types, species of plant that weren't native to that area, weren't adapted to it, and everything was hunky-dory as that um, documentary. I love PBS. It's like happy violin music, and then suddenly it gets all dark. Um, but yeah, then it, a drought hit. Everything dried out, and the problem was that there was no grass holding the soil down. I know it's weird to think, but plants are hugely important for keeping the topsoil layer stable, and with nothing there, it just dried up to dust and then the wind just picked it up. And so as you saw, those massive clouds of dirt got carried as far as like the East Coast, like it was uh, nuts. Uh, and it led to famine, starvation, it was not a good situation. Uh, but something that um, we have learned a lot from. So 
I want to just show you some slides to quickly review this. Let me just pull up my iPad here really quickly. Um, I think I have some poll questions ready to, sorry, give me one second. I forgot to uh, clear it from my previous lesson here. All right. I'm going to share my screen and my iPad, right play. Okay, can I just get verbal confirmation? Everyone's seeing a dust bowl in front of them? Yeah. yeah. Great. All right. And I'm trying to remember if I have poll questions relating to this. I don't think I do. Oh, okay, that's fine. So uh, here's a yeah, image again of the Dust Bowl. Again, you can see that cloud of dirt headed towards that town. Um, so learned a lot about proper management, um, especially in open plains like that where the wind can cause wind erosion, which is something you've read about. So what exactly causes wind, right? Why does this layer of gas that we exist in, the troposphere, uh, move? And it's all about molecular spacing, right? You have to think of air as being full of molecules, as you can see pictured here, right? So those are oxygen molecules, nitrogen molecules, and everything else that's inside air. And um, chemistry in general, right, it follows the law of diffusion, that molecules always want to be spaced apart. So things will always go from where there's too many of them, right, where there's very high pressure, lots of collisions, to where there's less of them, right? Everything wants to space out as much as possible. And so that is the sort of net force of wind, right? And the greater the difference between high and low pressure, the more powerful the wind is. You often hear this a lot when storms are rolling in, right? The wind suddenly kicks up, everyone will say, oh, the pressure is dropping. Uh, and again, that's just because there's literally space opening up and uh, air is rushing in to fill it. That's what generates the wind you feel. Um, there was a homework question about a chemistry classroom that's venting air out, right? So a lot of chemistry classrooms have vents because there's bad chemicals and stuff that's burning and you don't want students breathing that in all the time. And so air gets vented out. That means there's technically less air, less dense air in the classroom. And so if a student were to open a door, air would come rushing into the room. Um, because there's more air outside, less air inside, right? There's a pressure difference. And you've probably experienced this if you've ever had trouble opening a door or closing a door before because of the difference in wind patterns. It actually happens in Rosen a lot, especially at night. Uh, Rosen's also ventilated. And um, so I've gone down there where it's, you can literally hear the wind coming through the door sometimes when you open it or close it. Um, you definitely want to be careful that if you've got very high wind speeds in combination with low temperatures, uh, that can be very, very dangerous to your skin because it's gonna cause what's called frostbite, which is uh, pictured over here. It happens in various levels, but basically it's when your living tissue of your skin freezes. So you've got a outer layer of skin that's just dead cells. That's okay, that can get damaged. Uh, but you get what's called frost nip, which is um, basically it's getting so cold that your skin cells aren't able to stay alive. They can't get the oxygen they need. Uh, then it turns into frostbite. You get these crazy giant swellings of liquid. That's what you often see in people who been overexposed to cold. But then this is the really dangerous part um, where it becomes necrotic. So basically that's dead, rotted um, flesh. That's it's like you're rotting, but you're still alive. Um, not a good situation to have. Uh, and definitely will occur if you are experiencing high wind and low temperatures. This is why you see climbers in places like Mount Everest or K2 are covered head to toe, right? They don't have their hands out. Uh, even their noses often are kept covered up completely so that they don't get frostbite on the nose. Now, sea breeze and land breeze, I think, is pretty straightforward, um, especially if you're over here in Pebble Beach. We get a lot of sea breezes. Um, this is what keeps Pebble Beach a uh, nice temperate area, right? Wind's always coming off of the Pacific, and uh, it's been cooled down, so things stay cooler here. Uh, and then land breezes, this tends to be warmer air that has been coming in off of the land and is headed up the ocean. I don't know if this necessarily always follows like sea breeze during the day and land breeze at night. I think there is some variation, um, but it's just a helpful way of thinking about it. I like that they got the little guy with his fire showing which way the smoke goes. So this creates what are called uh, gyres, basically, these, these spinning patterns. And the, what generates this, again, is just to remember that warm air, does anyone know how warm air behaves? Does warm air rise or fall? Rise. It, it rises and then it will fall afterwards, right? But it's uh, it's part of this gyrus that warm air is going to rise up. So 
you can see it here happening on the equator, right? The, this tends to be warmer temperatures on the land. And so this cool air has fallen and then it's gonna warm up as it travels along the equator and then rises back up again right at that point. Um, and then cools down in the upper um, regions of the troposphere and falls back down again. So cold air falls. And so this is again, what creates sort of the general wind patterns that we see on the surface of our planet. And we've now, thanks to satellites and things like that, been able to study these. But even before satellites, sailors were very conscious of which way the winds blew in certain regions of the ocean, right? They knew to catch the westerlies to head to the um, uh, east or the northeast trade winds, right? Things like that. They also knew to avoid the equator, specifically what were called the doldrums, which is kind of this like dead zone, uh, where again, you've just got hot air rising, and so no uh, wind is really, a, um, you could get stalled there if you're in a, a sailing ship or something like that. Okay. What you're gonna explore today through an activity is the Coriolis effect, which uh, is hard to sort of explain, and, and this diagram does an okay job, but I'm hoping the activity will clarify it a little bit more. It's all about reference point, okay? This is the thing with Coriolis effect. It's just about what you see and what's going on with you. So it's the deflection of moving objects when they're viewed in a rotating reference. So imagine this is a normal situation, two people throwing a ball at each other, right? Ball moves forward, this person sees the ball move forward, right? It's all the same. But in this situation, they're on this like merry-go-round or something that's spinning. Suddenly, the perspective of this person has changed, that even though they threw the ball straight at that person, right? So there's the ball still going in that same straight line we saw earlier. But now that they're on a merry-go-round, this person who is supposed to catch the ball is now moving away from it, and this person is moving towards it. And so from this person's perspective, it appears to be bending in its path as you throw it. Um, even though it actually isn't. So that's the Coriolis effect. Uh, and this is gonna influence wind in particular. So you'll do an activity today that I hope will clarify this a little bit, um, but it's really important for determining, especially wind patterns. And uh, for example, what hurricanes and typhoons, which direction of rotation they show, depending on whether they're in the Northern or Southern hemisphere. Uh, ocean currents are also hugely important for weather. I know we don't often think about that, but the ocean is often warming up the air or cooling down the air that's above it. Um, and so not surprising, we see very warm waters towards the equator, which are gonna then warm up the air around them. We see, again, warm temperatures in places that are next to these parts of the ocean. Uh, and then you see colder water temperatures um, in the Northern and Southern hemispheres. And it explains a little bit about like the different coasts of the United States, right? So if you see, the east coast of the US right here, and if anyone's been to Florida or the Carolinas or something, um, the ocean water is relatively warm, and that's because it's coming up from the equator, right, through the Caribbean. Uh, whereas here in California, surfers and stuff have to wear wetsuits if they're gonna stay in the water for a long period of time, and that's because our water is actually very cold. It's coming down from the north. So you can kind of see that distinction right there in terms of the way the ocean currents are flowing. Um, and this has huge implications for marine life, um, which we'll hopefully get to explore a little bit later this year. Uh, but also, again, contributes to wind patterns, right? It, it heats up or cools down the wind in certain regions, and that's why, you, again, you see warmer air temperatures over certain continents and colder air temperatures over other continents. All right, any questions or comments on that? Okay, you're gonna do a bit of a drawing activity today relating to the Coriolis effect. Uh, so we are on the tasks to complete list step number four, simulating the Coriolis effect. You're going to click on that assignment right there, simulating the Coriolis effect. It'll take you to this quiz. And the instructions are here and the links that you need are all here. So just take the quiz and go in order of the questions. Uh, you're going to need paper, scissors, uh, something to draw a circle with. Uh, and a little push pin or something so you can spin things around and at least a marker of one different color. Uh, in short, you're going to be basically making a, a picture of the northern hemisphere, very rudimentary picture, you don't have to copy this perfectly, and of the southern hemisphere. We're going to be then spinning them around and using a marker to kind of indicate the effect of the Coriolis effect and, and what happens when you try to draw a straight line but end up being that straight. So this is what you'll end up making if you do follow the directions correctly. As usual, I have a demonstration video for both things. So here's a link to a demonstration video for the Northern Hemisphere, and then here's a link to the demonstration video for the Southern Hemisphere. I think they're about five to seven minutes long. I encourage you to just watch the video and kind of work along with it. Um, might be the best thing to do, but you can also read and follow the steps 
in the quiz questions uh, themselves. And then there are a couple questions you have to answer based on what you make once you've done that. I'll be here listening. If you have questions, if you're not sure what to do, or you can't find something that you think you need, I'll try to help you through an alternative or something like that. Otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and time for 25 minutes, uh, and then we'll come back together to check in. Sound good? Uh, if you do end up finishing before 25 minutes, you're welcome to then work on the Ed Puzzle, which is the next task to complete. You can do that. If you're not finished in 25 minutes, don't panic. It's okay. You can continue to work on this as homework or for the remainder of class.